Thank you, Ingvil, very much for arranging this session. Um, Gareth said initially when he presented first this morning that he felt the pressure of being first. I think when I found out I was last, I wasn't thrilled about that until I heard all of your presentations. And I realize now that some of you, I think maybe especially Gareth and Matthew and Chance in the back, your presentations are going to make my presentation a lot easier. So now I'm actually glad that I'm last. Um, so that's OK. Um, I'm currently uh, working towards a PhD in York. Um, which is part of a project, is that my hand? <laughs> um, part of a project, a collaborative project between the University of York and the Council for British Archaeology, uh, which is the public, the, an organization for the public's interest in archaeology in the UK. Um, it's a collaborative project um, which follows on from collaborative, collaborative projects that the Department of Archaeology have had with the CBA in the past, um, among other things leading to the development of the Local Heritage Engagement Network, which is a new initiative um, that essentially looks at developing capacity in local heritage communities to advocate for their local heritage. Um, and in relationship to that, my project, which looks specifically at stewardship, um, is looking more at um, how communities are involved in taking care of heritage rather than just advocating for its importance. Um, the project has two strands of impact and sustainability. Um, and my project, my part of the project is exclusively the sustainability strand. So that, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it has been suggested that community-led heritage stewardship is inherently sustainable. Um, what my project does is to try to investigate whether that is actually true. Um, so I'm critically investigating the sustainability of heritage stewardship communities, because if the communities that perform these stewardship um, activities are not sustainable in, in themselves, then a community-led approach cannot be considered sustainable either. Um, and this has led me to developing two key questions, which are how sustainable is community-led heritage stewardship and how can sustainability be facilitated in heritage stewardship communities? Um, why digitally? Why does my project have anything to do with digital? Um, well, the heritage economy in the UK is increasingly grant dependent. Um, if you want to use grants are essentially lump sums of money um, so you'll have an amount of money or you'll have money over a period of time, um, which I consider an unsustainable funding source. Uh, so if you're funding something that is supposed to facilitate sustainability with something that is unsustainable, then you, you have a problem here. So how can we facilitate sustainability with that, within an unsustainable economy? Um, and my suggested silver bullet solution is digital co-creation. Um, so what my project attempts to do is to facilitate sustainability in heritage stewardship communities um, through the provision of a suite of digital tools that are co-created with um, the target user communities. Um, and one of these tools is, is what I'm going to be discussing today. Um, I don't want to talk too much about, could spend all day talking about what's archaeology, what's heritage, how do those concepts relate to each other, is archaeology part of heritage, is heritage part of archaeology. Um, when it comes to management and conservation, um, I see heritage as being a broader concept than archaeology. Um, and when we manage or conserve an archaeological site or an archaeological object, um, as archaeologists, we have to recognize that a lot of people who are not archaeologists value these things for very different reasons, maybe from why we value them. Um, and so a heritage object is more than just archaeological research material. Um, and what values-based approaches to heritage do are to try to um, formalize what is significant, what is important about an heritage, a heritage object or an archaeological site, um, and use that to drive the management process. Um, increasingly, people are recognizing that these heritage values that define heritage, that define what's important about archaeology, um, are mutable, which means that they can change. Um, those of you who are archaeologists will probably be familiar with Thompson's rubbish theory, which essentially explains how something valuable becomes rubbish and becomes valuable again. Um, and so if we believe in this idea, then values must change, they must be mutable, they must be subjective, which leads us to questioning authority, who decides 
whose interpretation of value of significance is the right one? How do we, how do we make these decisions? Um, again, leading on to the idea that cultural significance is multivocal, um, which means you can have contrasting and conflicting interpretations of what heritage is and, and what's important about it. Um, and what a values-based approach to management does is it tries to understand these contrasting, conflicting, um, intermeshing interpretations and to use that to drive decision-making processes. Um, although on the theoretical side of things, conservators and heritage managers are increasingly talking about values-based approaches are great, this is what everyone should be doing. Um, they require um, talking to non-professionals um, because uh, as Gareth demonstrated, um, non-professional um, information can add an awful lot to our understanding of heritage and to understanding how um, people value heritage and how they may respond to changes that conservators make to heritage. Um, and doing consultation can be very time consuming, which means it can be very expensive, uh, which means if it's ever done, it's probably only ever done once. Um, and so you'll end up with either not doing consultation or having outdated consultation data that drives your decision making processes which essentially means the whole values-based approach falls apart. So how can we facilitate a values-based approach in practice? Can we assess significance digitally? Um, can we harness the digital humanities and apply this to heritage management? Um, one approach from the digital humanities that's interesting is social media mining, uh, which is essentially trawling through blogs, through social media sites like Twitter or Facebook. Um, to pull out information about what people are saying about different things. So can you use social media mining to mine the internet to find out what people think is important about heritage? Um, unfortunately, this kind of data doesn't really exist online. Um, at least that's my impression. If it does, then tell me where I can find it. Um, which means that the data has to be created, um, which brings me to crowdsourcing or community sourcing. Um, which is essentially encouraging, um, well, with crowdsourcing, the crowd, the anonymous crowd, the internet, uh, to contribute information to something or to perform tasks that you need performed. Um, community sourcing is a little bit different. Um, I think we could say that, I'd even suggest that, that your project is maybe a community sourcing project more than a crowdsourcing project and that it targets a specific uh, community of interest. Um, that contributes to your project. Um, and if you have an explicitly community sourcing approach, um, then you can allow interaction between users, for example. So you can build community through, a, um, whereas in a crowdsourcing approach, you want, um, you don't want your users to be, to be influenced by each other, so you keep them separate. Um, so by allowing interaction, you can build communities, which for um, building heritage stewardship communities is obviously beneficial. What this allows you to do is to have consultation data that is born digital. So you don't have to spend time interviewing people in person. You don't have to spend time digitizing your data. Uh, you can go directly into data analysis and manipulation. Um, and um, in the other crowdsourcing presentation as well, talking about different tasks that are assigned to users. So you can also engage users in, pro in being involved in data processing and organizing your information, putting it together towards writing up statements of significance. Um, one interesting thing is looking at um, when do we apply machine learning and when do we apply um, these so so super users. So often in um, crowdsourcing projects for heritage, you end up having a few individuals who do the majority of the work. And these are often referred to as super users. Um, and what, what the reason I have this in the point of this is essentially um, community sourcing for heritage is seen as an extension of volunteering that is seen as a benefit some people say an inherently beneficial activity. Um, so by participating in volunteering in heritage, you get benefits as an individual. At least we believe that's the case. Um, and so can we distinguish between which tasks give benefits to users and which don't? So maybe more boring things that you don't want your users to have to spend your time doing. Can you apply machine learning to do, to do those tasks instead? Um, very briefly, um, my Middle Temple was a pilot application that I was involved in developing when I was a student at UCL in London. 
um, I was working with computer science students and the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple um, to develop um, a pilot app for doing for automating stakeholder consultation essentially. What this does is that um, it allows you to create a profile. You get a profile page to which you can upload a series of posts like Facebook or Twitter. Um, and what your profile post uh, page does is it aggregates all these different posts and organizes them. Um, so here, the bottom left, oh, this picture's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> Um, the, the bottom left, I apologize for these hideous colors, um, but the posts are essentially distributed according to a model um, that conceptualizes heritage as forms, relationships, and practices, trying to get a holistic view of what <coughs> heritage is. And on the right, here you'll see, so the posts are organized by title in the figure and then in list form below. And clicking on the title takes you to the expanded information um, in the post list. Um, which, in theory, would allow users to upload what they perceive as being important about the Middle Temple, what is the heritage about the Middle Temple, interacting with each other. Um, and also then you have um, an app homepage that aggregates information from all the different profile pages. So you get a comprehensive overview of what people are saying about the significance of, of the Middle Temple. Um, what does this have to do with my current project? Well. One of the features, the digital tools, um, that I'm very going to shortly, shortly start co-creating has to do with um, an, ex an extension, essentially, of the My Middle Temple application um, to allow communities to upload what posts about what they think is important about their local heritage um, and to have this information aggregated so that people together can get a cohesive vision of what does our group believe our heritage is, what is important about our heritage, um, to formalize a, a group identity, a common purpose, common goals, as, as a beginning towards stewardship processes, essentially. Um, but before um, looking at that specifically, I just want to pause and think about what it is digital does. Um, what happens to our projects when we work with digital tools um, is the digital severe neutral, um, which ties into my title of democratizing the digital. On the one hand, the digital world and the internet allows us to spread access. You can access things remotely. You can have a lot more people accessing a common platform. You can share information. Um, digital information is a lot easier to analyze and to process. Uh, you can manipulate it and communicate it in different ways. But at the same time, as in society overall, um, in the digital realm, you have inclusion and exclusion. And these who is included and excluded in the digital world may be the same or may be different from um, our societies otherwise. Um, the digital world can perpet perpetuate hierarchies or create new hierarchies. You also have power online, which I think is aptly demonstrated by Wikipedia, um, which has its own Wikipedia page about gender bias on Wikipedia, um, where you can find this nice graph at the bottom, which also is showing up really badly, um, which has a title I love that says, Wikipedia editors are predominantly male it says. Um, and when you read the figure, you see that 90% of editors on Wikipedia are men, 9% um, are women, and 1% are transgender. Um, so on the one hand, you have the internet, Wikipedia, which democratizes knowledge, provides access to everyone, is supposed to be equal and democratic, and seems to be a lot less equal than um, the rest of society. So essentially, why am I bringing this up? When we do digital projects, we can't assume open access using the internet. Oh, it's available, it's accessible to everyone. We've got to build accessibility into the way we work with digital tools. Um, so finally, to, um, to my project now, with using co-creation, um, my approach is looking at co-creating products and the power of co-creative processes. Um, the one of the main problems with the Middle Temple application, why it remains a pilot and it now is no longer online, um, is that the members of the Middle Temple are barristers or students who are wanting to become barristers. Um, the Middle Temple is not a heritage organization, although it has a lot of what we would call heritage. Um, 
the members of the Middle Temple um, don't really perceive a need for the My Middle Temple application. Their reason for being associated with the Middle Temple has to do with their professional life more than their interest in heritage. Um, so they would need convincing that this is something they want. Um, the Middle Temple organization is also not too keen on having anyone on the internet writing things about the organization, um, which it wouldn't have been open to everyone, but that was how the project was perceived by them, um, which is a common pro problem, I think, with digital humanities projects, is that you have a great idea about what the world needs, but if the world doesn't want it, it's not going to be successful. Um, what co-creation essentially does is, by working with communities who are your target communities who you want to use this application, um, you can work with them to identify actual needs, the kinds of functionality that they require, um, to develop intuitive interfaces that aren't just intuitive to us maybe, but also intuitive to other people who you want to use this, um, and to identify necessary alternative access routes. So if you're creating a digital project and it only exists digitally, what about people who aren't really digital, digitally literate? Um, so one of the things that interests me about crowdsourcing and, or community sourcing and dividing tasks is, can you have an analog way, as in a paper-based way, of submitting information to the, um, to the application by having people working locally, maybe, or digitizing other people's contributions. So a way of um, diversifying the different volunteering tasks we have in our projects um, to give different access routes. Um, my research model uses action research. Um, so the different tools for my platform with the CBA um, are going to be created as um, iterative individual work packages, essentially, for, for each tool for the platform. Um, beginning with an action research approach that is driven by myself very much top down to through the process, so harnessing the transformative potential of co-creation, um, to change communities by co-creating with them, that by the end of the process, they can initiate their own um, co-creative processes um, they can apply for grant funding, they can identify specialists they want to work with, um, and they can essentially replicate the process to develop tools that they perceive that they need themselves. Um, so essentially, by co-creation, giving communities the power to sustain themselves, um, and really focusing on building diversity into um, the creation process and who hold holds power in the community. Um, so how, how is this sustainable? Are digi is digital sustainable? Well, no, you would say. We just heard earlier today that five years is a great project life um, for, for a digital application. So, and this is really where the co-creative process becomes significant, is that if user communities, if digital literacy can be built through co-creation, user communities can do regular maintenance design costs can be offset by grant funding, um, and communities um, through the co-creative process get um, attain the ability to develop new tools as they become necessary in the future. And so you create essentially a sustainable um, ecosystem. Um, and um, finally then, why is it necessary for me and for my project to democratize the digital? Well, because if the digital is not democratized, um, then it cannot be sustainable, and then it cannot um, help communities sustain themselves. But if it is democratized, um, then communities can have agency over their own sustainability. Thank you very much.